loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. And if you loving it, you can't get enough of it. Put a hand high, right where the other is. Sit a week, but can't find a quitter with me. It's that bit of sweet literature that literally is straight. Walk with the Prince of Peace. See where these footprints lead. Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to cover glycolysis and make it as easy as possible to understand. So let's get started. So first off, let's first identify the molecule that enters the glycolysis pathway. And the first molecule that enters the glycolysis pathway is glucose. So glucose is a six carbon molecule, pictured here as a hexagon. It's important to memorize and understand this shape because all the future molecules that occur in glycolysis are based, are derivatives off of the glucose molecule. So six carbon molecule right here, hexagon shape, this is the basic glucose molecule. So the first step of glycolysis, and one of the most important steps, is the reaction facilitated by hexokinase. Anytime you hear the word kinase, realize that this enzyme works on phosphate groups, either adds or removes a phosphate group. And how does it do this? It utilizes ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's adenosine with three phosphates. In these phosphate bonds are energy. So ATP comes in, it donates a phosphate group, and it becomes adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates. In donating a phosphate group, it's donating energy as well. So hexokinase facilitates this, and in doing so, it adds a phosphate group at the sixth carbon of glucose. So you have a glucose molecule, with the phosphate group at the 6 carbon. So you want to guess what this is called? Well, it's called glucose 6 phosphate. And you can count here, and I show you the numbers of how to count the carbons. Now you have glucose 6 phosphate. You've just undergone the first reaction that is both rate limiting and requires energy, requires ATP. It's a high yield step to know. The next step is utilizing glucose 6 phosphate as well as the enzyme phosphoglucoisomerase. Isomerase, meaning this enzyme creates an isomer. It just changes the configuration of glucose 6-phosphate. We're not adding a molecule. We're not subtracting any molecules. So glucose 6-phosphate gets converted to this pentagon-like figure. Still note, there are six carbons present, but now we have a central pentagon instead of that hexagon we had with glucose. So what this called is called fructose 6 phosphate. The pentagon represents fructose, an isomer of glucose, and we have the phosphate group on the 6 carbon. So this is called fructose 6 phosphate. Now, the next step is really important. We go from fructose 6 phosphate to our second energy requiring step, and our enzyme here is phosphofructokinase. Again, kinase. So we know there's a movement of a phosphate group here. Phosphofructose is acting on fructose 6-phosphate. So ATP comes in, it donates a phosphate group and becomes ADP and also donates energy. This phosphofructokinase adds this phosphate to where? To the first carbon. So you have a fructose molecule with a phosphate group at the first carbon, a phosphate group at the sixth carbon. So want to guess what this is called? Well, it's called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. It's a fructose molecule with a phosphate group at the 1 carbon and a phosphate group at the 6 carbon. Now, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate undergoes a complicated step. You can see it's a 6-carbon molecule here, but under the reaction of aldolase, it becomes cut into two 3-carbon molecules. It can either become dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or it can become glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate are isomers of one another. So the body regulates how much glycolysis occurs partly in utilizing this step. If there's too much glycolysis that occurs, this reversible reaction favors dihydroxyacetone phosphate, almost act like a break on glycolysis. But if the body requires energy, it's going to promote 
the production of glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. And the enzyme triphosphate isomerase creates this balance and favors one molecule over the other based on how much ATP and ADP is present in the body. So once you have glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, the next step is a dehydrogenase reaction. Glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase comes in, so it's removing hydrogen ions. So NAD, a hydrogen ion carrier, and an inorganic phosphate group come in. The NAD picks up hydrogen ions, and the phosphate group is donated. In this process, we produce 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, otherwise known as 1,3-BPG. This molecule is so important, not only for, for glycolysis, but 1,3-BPG is a precursor to 2,3-BPG, otherwise known as 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 2,3-BPG regulates hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen in our red blood cells. So that's why this molecule has a dual importance. Now, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate goes on to the next step where it's acted on by phosphoglycerate kinase. Kinase, again, a mo an enzyme that acts on phosphate groups. But before we were putting in energy, we were giving up ATP. Here, we're going to actually be producing ATP. So this kinase removes a phosphate. So ADP comes in and it picks up a phosphate by utilizing the kinase, creating ATP. Now realize, we're working with one three carbon molecule here. We started off with a six carbon molecule that got split up into two three carbon molecules. So all the reactions from here on out are in duplicate. So really for every glucose molecule, at this step we're producing two ATP, okay? So think about that and try to understand that. Now, once kinase has acted, it produces three phosphoglycerate, why? We had one, a phosphate at the 1 and 3 group of 1,3-BPG. Kinase removed a phosphate at the 1 carbon, leaving us the phosphate at the 3rd carbon, creating 3-phosphoglycerate. Now that we have 3-phosphoglycerate, the next step is phosphoglyceromutase. So this enzyme phosphoglyceromutase changes around the molecule. It mutates it. There's no change in the molecule's presence. So there's no leaving of hydrogen or oxygen or phosphate. It just changes around the molecules that are there. This phosphoglycerate mutase gets converted 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate. So essentially it takes that phosphate group, takes it from a third carbon and attaches it to the second carbon. Now we have 2-phosphoglycerate. The next step is converting 2-phosphoglycerate using enolase to another molecule called phosphoenolpyruvate. In doing so, we release water. So this is the first step we've released water. And you can see where the oxygen and hydrogen come from, from the second and third carbons. Now we have phosphoenolpyruvate. This is an, a very important molecule because phosphoenolpyruvate is involved in the last step of glycolysis. So phosphoenolpyruvate is acted upon by pyruvate kinase, a kinase again. So we know a phosphate is going to be removed. Pyruvate kinase utilizes ADP. So ADP comes in, swoops in, takes a phosphate, becoming ATP. Again, another energy-producing step. In acting, pyruvate kinase converts phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate, the last molecule in glycolysis. Pyruvate goes on to the Krebs cycle, or if there's no oxygen present, goes on to form lactic acid. But we'll talk about those in some other video. But this is our last molecule and our last energy producing step. So what are the key points to understand about glycolysis? Well, first off, understanding glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of the cell. You start off with glucose and you end with two pyruvates. Glycolysis works in both anaerobic and aerobic conditions. You produce four ATP, but consume two ATP. So you net two ATP per glucose molecule. You produce two NADH and hydrogen ions for every glucose produced, and you'll be utilizing those later. 
you also produce two water molecules as well. What's really important to memorize is really understand the rate limiting steps. Which ones require ATP? Those are your rate limiting steps. Understand that ATP and ADP regulate glycolysis. So if your body needs energy, it's going to promote glycolysis and promote the production of ATP. If your body has too much ATP, it's not going to promote glycolysis. It's going to downregulate glycolysis. And remember the ATP producing steps that we talked about. If you really want to get like 100% an ACID test, keep track of where your phosphates and hydrogens leave and enter. Sometimes they'll ask you that they'll put a radio tracer on a certain oxygen and ask you where does it leave the energy production cycle of the cell. So that's a brief review of glycolysis. If you like this video, make sure to share it with your friends on Facebook as well as Twitter. Give it a like. Also, if you have any comments or suggestions or questions, place them down below. And most importantly, subscribe. It's Dr. K from my medical school, and I'll see you next time.